In this video, I'll be building the smallest MATX gaming PC for under $1,000. This compact system can run AAA games at 1440p on high settings. Let's take a look at the components that will go into this build. For the CPU, I chose the Intel Core i5-12490F, which is a slightly stronger version of the 12400F. Its maximum turbo clock speed is 0.2GHz higher, and it has 2MB more L3 cache. Unfortunately, this CPU is only available in the Chinese market. However, you can replace it with a standard 12400F. The difference between them is around 2%. If you prefer building an AM4 system instead, you can get the 5600X for similar performance, but it's almost 100 bucks more expensive than the 12400F, and you probably need to downgrade your GPU and other components. In order to keep the CPU cool in such a tiny case, low-profile air coolers are the only options. It can't go over 75mm in height or else it will collide with the PSU. So in this case, the Thermalrite AXP90 X53 is perfect. Its heatsink is equipped with four 6mm heat pipes and cooled by a 90mm fan. The height of the entire cooler, including the fan, is 53mm tall, so it will fit into the case easily. For the GPU, I had to choose between the 5060 Ti and the 9060 XT because of their 16GB of VRAM. However, since upscaling and frame generation are essential for these mid-range graphics cards, the 5060 Ti appears to be the better choice, even though it costs $70 more. For the motherboard, I went for the Maxon B760M Challenger D4 Wi-Fi. That's right, it's a DDR4 motherboard. Since Intel's 12th to 14th generation processors support both DDR4 and DDR5 RAM, building a DDR4 system at the end of 2025 and possibly 2026 seems to be a more affordable option, since the so-called RAM shortage will likely continue until 2027. For the RAM, I selected the Corsair Vengeance LPX DDR4 modules, rated for 3600 megatransfers per second with a CL18 cast latency, providing a total capacity of 32GB. As for storage, it's gonna be the Clefcrass C925G. Its performance is identical to the regular C925, but it comes with an integrated graphene copper heatsink instead of an aluminium one. The sequential read and write speeds are among the fastest available, while the random access rates are comparable to those of other mid-tier Gen 4 SSDs. It doesn't have any DRAM cache, but there is no noticeable performance issue in gaming. Now, this system requires at least a 450 watt rated PSU. However, I couldn't find any fully modular PSUs under 650 watts. So I ended up choosing the Thermalrite KG650. It's an 80 plus gold, 650 watt power supply that's just 140mm in length, slightly shorter than standard ATX PSUs. The more compact size makes cable management easier in the small MATX case that I'll be introducing next. This is one of, if not the tiniest, MATX PC cases available on the market. The Johnspo C6 MATX. It is 202mm wide, 266mm deep, and 295.2mm tall, with a total volume just under 16 litres. The variant I bought comes with an nylon handle, making it easier to be carried around when needed. Just look at how tiny it is when compared to my Tower 300 build. It's ridiculous when you think about how powerful this compact PC is going to be when it's all set. I've also added three Arctic P12 PWM fans to maintain a positive air pressure inside the case, so that the PC doesn't become an air purifier and collects tons of dust. The entire bill costs 964 and 41 cents. If you include the contact frame and M.2 SSD heatsink from Thermalrite, it will be around $970, right under the $1,000 mark. Now, enjoy the building process. I'll cover some benchmarks and the thermals afterwards.
Alright, so the PC booted without any issues, and I tried to enable XMP to maximize the CPU performance. However, when I was running the ADA64 RAM test, the PC just shut down without any warnings. Turns out the SA voltage of the 12490F was running at around 0.9 volts, which is clearly not enough for RAM overclocking. And it cannot be unlocked because it's a non-K Intel CPU. So if you want to overclock your RAM, you might want to go for the 12600K or KF model instead. Anyway, I had to overclock the RAM manually, or else the latency and data transfer rate would be absolutely terrible. The RAM sticks ended up running at 3200 mega transfers per second, CL16. Now that everything runs stably, it's time for some benchmarks. In 3D Mark Time Spy, this small form factor PC got over 9400 for CPU score and well over 15000 for the GPU with default settings. I managed to get an extra 10% performance out of the GPU by undervolting and overclocking. The final GPU score is slightly over 17,000. Moving on to first-person shooter games, in CS2 with high settings, the average FPS is 233 and the 1% low is 114. In Valorant with high settings, the average FPS is 320 and 171 for 1% low. These numbers aren't that impressive because a CPU bottleneck is present when running the benchmarks. Now, moving on to a very demanding AAA game, Hogwarts Legacy. This PC managed to get 90 FPS on average and 1% low of 36 FPS with ultra graphics settings in native 1440p. DLSS quality bumps the average FPS by 10, but the 1% low doesn't change much. Although 4x frame gen brings the average FPS to 262, the 1% low did not improve whatsoever. After enabling ray tracing, the FPS is much worse. The average FPS in native 1440p drops by half to 46. The LSS quality doesn't help much here, and it performs even worse than running in native 1440p. 4x frame gen brings the average FPS to 146, but 1% low is so low that you can feel the stuttering every time you move. The poor 1% low performance is most likely because the population density is set to ultra and causes a very heavy load on the CPU. Mind you that the 12490F is just an entry-level gaming CPU, so don't expect much from it in CPU demanding tasks. It's better to lower the population density to high or even medium for a smoother experience without impacting the visuals. On the other hand, the 5060 Ti with 16GB of VRAM has no issues in native 1440p gaming, as long as you don't crank up the ray tracing settings. Now, let's move on to thermals. Temperature is quite important for a compact build due to limited airflow, and higher temps will restrict the component's actual performance. So, to test how well this system cools the CPU and GPU, I ran both ADA64 FPU and Fermark stress test for 10 minutes. By default, the CPU runs at 94 degrees Celsius and the GPU runs at 76. After undervolting and overclocking the GPU, its temperature drops to 72 and the CPU temp is also lowered to 92 due to lower GPU temperature. 92 degrees on the CPU might seem a bit high, but as long as it doesn't hit the temperature limit of 100 degrees Celsius, there will be no thermal throttling issue. 2026 might not be the best time for PC building, but you can still get yourself a 1440p gaming PC under $1000 that will last you for at least the next 5 years. On top of that, the PC itself is very compact and you can basically put it anywhere you want and it will most likely fit. Besides, the fan noise of this build is barely noticeable when idling and it remains very quiet when gaming. It's a perfect all-rounder budget gaming PC in 2026.